Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I am thrilled to be here today and honored that, uh, to give this talk. This is my first time down under, and I'm glad that it is for such an occasion. I hope that this inaugural, inaugural GO conference will be the first of many. And I'm here to celebrate with you for this year, 10 years of GO. So uh, it's, it's 30th October back home, so I get to say 10 years to the day, because you're always in tomorrow. But 10 years exactly to the day, Rob Pike gave an internal Google TED Talk, previewing the release of his new, his new language called Go. And 12 days later, on November 10th, it was open source to the public. Here's a, the announcement here on the Google open source blog, short and sweet, hey ho, let's go. We're not, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> Let's see here. Let's see what we got here. I did a thing, and uh, all right, here we go. No? Okay. Once we do go, you're gonna find this to be highly ironic. Um, <laughs> once I get going here. All right. Maybe here? All right, I'm gonna do this way. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Here's the Wayback Machine. Here's what the Go blog, golang.org, looked on that day. I'd like to think that for all those detractors that are out there, um, we have indeed evolved. <laughs> and this is a hashtag that I want you to use next month called Go Turns 10 as we celebrate globally together. So 10 years. <laughs> In order to reflect on these 10 years, I'd like to tell a story in three parts. First, I'd like to briefly recount the influences on what made Go, Go, going back a few decades. And also collectively imagine what the future holds. So, the three parts I'd like to call foundations, reflections, predictions. A journey like this reminds me much of one of my favorite books called All the Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. Who's aware of it? Hands? Okay, fair number. This book concerns the journey of life with all its challenges, choices, trade-offs, and successes. And as you know, Go programmers can't resist Go puns. So think of this talk as a similar journey or just a way to let me take you all over the place and leave you thinking, well, that was some trip. But it's one I hope you enjoy. So let's off, let's be off. All right, let's zoom back in time. If you could humor the programming language historian in me. Programming languages from 16, 1960 to 2007. In the late 1950s, people were becoming uneasy with, on how each new computer spawned its own distinct language. And at the time, programming languages were provided by the hardware manufacturers and differed from model to model. And this is a book cover by Gene Samet, um, and it talks about the programming language Tower of ba Babel, which is a concept that was creeping in in the late 50s and early 60s. And it's very much like the myth of uh, the Tower of Babel in the Bible on the formation of natural languages. In January 1960, 13 computer scientists met in Paris for an unprecedented meeting to design the first truly universal machine-independent programming language. There were six delegates sent from America and seven from Europe. The Tower of Babel is also conical like Seuss's book cover. Coincidence? I think not. Alan Perlis, who's one of the 13, described it like this. I hate when other people read while I'm trying to read, so you're welcome. <laughs> and Alan Perlis is also awarded the inaugural Turing Award in 1966, and he's widely considered the founding father of computer science as a separate discipline. 
So Algol was the result. And I wanted to show you a quick and dirty and incomplete slide of Algol's influence. It's undeniable. And everyone, every single one of us in the room have it to thank for the formation of how we program. On the left-hand column, you'll see the C lineage, which spawned its own family of derivatives and descendants, C++, C Sharp, Objective C, and D. In the middle, there are the scripting language, languages. The syntax of PHP is also based on C, which means that the most used server-side language on the internet traces its lineage back to Algo. I could go on about the evolution of programming languages, but I want to talk about the evolution of concurrency now. The computer science of concurrency began with Edgar Dijkstra's seminal 1965 paper that introduced, mu introduced mutexes, which is a concurrency model based on shared memory. But the concurrency story starts with this man the year before, Douglas McElroy and Unix pipes. Here's the original memo right out of Bell Labs. We should have some ways of coupling programs like garden hose, screwing together another segment when it becomes necessary to massage data in another way. This is the way of I.O. also. So message passing concurrency begins with Doug McElroy. In 1978, the late great Tony Hoare published a paper which changed everything. It was decades ahead of its time. He called the paper Communicating Sequential Processes and Hoare's paper, uh, colloquially known as CSP. And the paper proposed a language with, uh, with processes running sequentially communicating with each other over unbuffered channels. And Hoare's communicating processes are more general than the typical Unix shell pipelines since they can be connected in arbitrary patterns. Now CSP over the next two decades will evolve into three branches, Occam, Erlang, actor-based concurrency, and then a third branch, which in call, in, uh, includes NewSqueak, Alice, and Limbo, all developed at Bell's Labs. NewSqueak communication mechanisms at, are as and exactly as CSP, with channels acting as rendezvous points for processes. Now, as we keep this newly learned history in mind, I want to branch off for a very important two years in this journey. Go's creation. So, this is how uh, the book says they looked up and down streets, looked them over with care. About some they said, I don't choose to go there. And I look at this and I want to show that there's trade-offs in choosing the path to take. There's no perfect languages, only trade-offs. However, during a 45-minute C++ build, and I think we've all maybe heard the story, but let me retell it again. A man by the name of Rob Pike, who was an engineer at the time at Google. I think he looks like that in 2007, too. If you've met him, you'll say, oh, the likeness is realistic. Um, but he, anyway, uh, he was doing some minor but central work on an enormous Google C++ program, and compilations were taking 45 minutes or on huge distributed compiler cluster at Google. And then an announcement came around that there was going to be a talk presented by a couple of Google employees serving on the C++ standards committee. And they were going to tell um, the rest of the Googlers what was coming in C++ 11. And in the span of the hour of that talk, we heard something new, like 30 new features that were being planned. And at this point, and this is Rob speaking, I asked myself a question. OK, I'll read it. Did the C++ committee really believe that was wrong? what was wrong with C++ was that it didn't have enough features? Surely, it would be a greater achievement to simplify the language rather than add to it. During this 45-minute compilation, Robert turns around in his chair. Sitting directly behind him was Robert Griesemer, also likeness spot on. And he's a computer scientist from ZTH in Zurich, Switzerland. The two of them started going back and forth on September 21st, 2007 for a few minutes, which then turned into an hour. And I'd like to imagine that those 45 minutes being like this famous XKCD com compiling classic. <coughs> As they really started to dig in into the second hour, they grab a colleague that wishes simply to be known as Ken. You may or may not know him. And he sat in the office next door. Now, if you remember the foundations of programming language lineage and concurrency that I mentioned before, Algol and CSP, they follow a trajectory like this. Algol evolves in two places. C-like languages evolve in the Americas, and Simula and Pascal evolve in Europe. 
Notable successors influencing Go here as well are, include Smalltalk and Oberon. And this is the abridged version, but I think you get the picture. So Go represents a convergence of these lineages and schools of thought by the very people who either created them or had a hand in creating these languages. In Ken Thompson, you have someone who worked at Bell Labs with Dennis Ritchie, the author of C, and he rewrote Unix in C, among many other things like regex and BCPL and B. In Rob Pike, you have Bell, also at Bell Labs and Ken's colleague, you have the inventor of Newsweek and various attempts at CSP throughout various languages. And Go finally becomes the language where his concurrency ideas, which have taken 20 years of trial and error to really shine. In Robert Griesemer, on the far right, is a PhD student at ZTH under the advisement of Niklas Wirth, who is his code advisor. This weekend I met with Griesemer and I made the American mistake of pronouncing Wirth's name as Wirth. And he said, oh, well, Americans pronounce his name by uh, value and Europeans pronounce his name by reference. Um, but under, uh, under uh, Niklas Wirth, who invented Oberon, um, he was, uh, Robert was supposed to do white and black box testing, and he really wasn't interested in it. And he, really, he took Oberon and he made a dialect, dialect called Oberon V for his PhD work. And as part of that, he got really into, um, enjoyed the idea of taking an existing language and whittling it down into something small, into like a vector space. And, that, and uh, his Oberon V could uh, compile to a Cray XMP. Who's worked on a Cray XMP? That's like serious goals. Nobody, yeah. Anyway, after many months and after adding a spec for the compiler, the three add two more to the fold. One a surprise, Ian Lance Taylor on the lower left, who had found the spec internally online at Google and just emailed one day and was like, hey, you got that new language you came up with? I wrote a compiler for one. Thanks, bro. Uh, and then a son of a coworker of Rob and Ken, and who grew up at, the, at Bell Labs. Um, and along with a few others, with these five, this period of two years was an intense period of creation and refinement. I used Algol as the example because I find the patterns that evolve in technical advances almost poetically similar. Creation, proliferation, complexity, and consolidation. In Algol, with the Tower of Babel, there was consolidation. In Go, the pattern happens as well for programming languages. Creation, proliferation, complexity, and consolidation. And that is the reason for Go. And one of the detractors, or one of the early um, insults about the language is that it looked like an, a language that was, seemed to be stuck in the 1980s when in fact it was designed to be simple and when they ch left out things or features of the language it's because they chose not to. It's not because they couldn't. So creation, proliferation, complexity, consolidation. Go's design philosophy is to stave off proliferation and complexity. And that is what it's doing, and that is its mission for the first 10 years and the next 10 years, and as long as it will exist. So one of the design principles is waiting for good design. No is temporary, yes is forever. Now, I like the idea of waiting for good design in the places you go, because there's a page, if you've read the book, about the waiting the place. And I really like, what I really like about this is that it normalizes waiting in our lives, right? In an industry where ship fast and break things has become the norm, it is refreshing for Go not to not do this. And I believe this is critical to Go's success. In our industry, there's also a bias towards action. And what are we really incentivizing here with green squares? To do things. And they may be mistakes, and they may not be the best of things, but you should do things. And while that makes sense in the context of learning, and while that makes sense in the context of productivity, is that really what uh, this is all about? Or maybe we should reflect a little bit more, and as also in the Aesop fable, Tortoise and the Hare, sometimes thinking slow, you think you go faster. So go slow to go fast. So whenever I think of Go um, and the design philosophy, I think of a lot of no's. For every yes that went into the language, there had to be many, many, <coughs> countless no's. And I think of this Thomas Edison quote, which comes to mind. 
Some versions, this one has 99. Some have, of course, con um, inflated it to 10,000. But it's basically, I once never, he, he doesn't look at failure this way. He looks at it in the inverse. I never once failed at making a light bulb. I just found 99 ways not to make one. And whenever I think of Thomas, and Thomas Edison now, oh my god, he's going to see this. I think of Ian Lance Taylor. I never once fail and failed at implementing generics. I just found 99 ways not to do them. And I mention this because the first email about generics predates the open source release in, uh, I think, the August 2019. Uh, tw sorry, 2009, and it, this is shared courtesy of Robert Griesemer. So Ian is a master at waiting for good design, and he models the no better than anyone. I think we're going to release some of this uh, content. It's courtesy of a legal hold, because if you remember, we had a talk about a reflection. We had a kerfuffle about using the word go to name a programming language since one already existed, and the status got closed as status unfortunate, and we kept it. But during the litigation, all of these wonderful um, early emails that may have gotten lost to history are now uh, on hold, and Robert kept them, and he's, we hope to release them for the 10th birthday. So what is it that we're looking for when we wait? And I think that the simple answer is, is it simple enough, right? But how do we know that we've achieved it? And I've heard a teammate, Filippo Varsorda, about Go say, when there's a doubt, Go says no. And this flies in the face of major other open source projects, um, especially when you tend to want that green contri contribution graph, right? And it sometimes can be for a very frustrating contributor experience. I hope this gives you a good foundation about the creation and the design philosophy of Go. I'd like to move on now to reflect over what's now the reflection part and the 10 years since the open source uh, in 2009. I wish I had like a Dr. Seuss voice or something, but I don't, so you can read it in your own head with your Dr. Seuss voice. Okay, so as we reflect over the last 10 years, um, my brain likes to stitch together timelines and try to see connections and what is affecting other things. And I typically um, uh, do this in some of my talks, but I typically have a, a time on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I try to take uh, different things. And so in the middle, I'm going to talk about what happened in the first five years in language and tooling. On the bottom, I'm going to try to capture this nebulous term like ecosystem or industry or software development zeitgeist. And then at the top, I'm going to mention cloud. Um, yeah, you'll see why later. But keep in mind that this is not exhaustive, right? This is just my recollection of things that have shaped me and likely all of you in the last 10 years. So the first one is GitHub. It's interesting to reflect over the last 10 years how development, whether in Go or any other language, has changed over that time. So developers, we were, who was developing back in 2009? How many of you have been around for 10 years? OK, so we were not pulling source code from GitHub in 2009, right? Most everyone used, who remembers it? Oh, rip. Oh, wow, yes. So, yes, right, but there was online, where would you get your source code? Yeah, source forge, right? Um, and, and in fact, the version control system that Go used at the time wasn't even Git. It was Mercurial. And Google Code was a competitor of sorts to GitHub, which eventually shut down in 2015. So the fact that Go will switch to Git in about four years here and mirrors it to GitHub has everything to do with the success of GitHub and also, I don't want to call GitLab a copycat, but I won't go there. And you know, you know, no one was copying a, a Mercurial or a SourceForge something like SourceFrog. I don't know. But anyways, and so, so basically, what GitHub did, and I would just want to give it a shout out, is that it centered the experiences around developers instead of users, and it made social coding mainstream. Um, the other thing is Instagram, like Rip original logo. I thought about some of the things that came about the same year that Go was open source, and, and um, Instagram was the, the killer app, the first one in the iPhone and Android age that launched. Um, now, Instagram is written in Python, but the reason why it brought my attention today was when I, or last week, when I was preparing for this talk, um, I read this on ZDNet. 
So how Instagram's taming a multi-million dollar Python monster. I don't mean to bash Python. I just want to say that the choice um, when, in, when Instagram got really, really big, choosing a language up front has trade-offs at the very beginning that sometimes we don't think of because we have short memories, right? And, I, and then every language also, um, what you might gain in dynamic typing for Python, you might have to pay for down the road, right? And workarounds and static checking and everything when you reach scale. And every app, of course, is not probably going to reach the success that Instagram has by being acquired by Facebook and whatnot. But in hindsight, the life, what I want you to take away from this is that the lifetime of maintaining code is the true developer productivity. And I want our memories to not be so short. Um, and I think the, funder, the creators of Go fundamentally understood this. So let's get back up to language and tooling. One notable addition and novel aspect about Go was GoFumpt, our canonical format enforcer. As and when this was released in 2009, I couldn't find um, some of the way back on the orange angry site, but people hated it. However, if you look at other language ecosystems, more and more are using automation to stop this tabs versus spaces, right? Oh. Go fumped, fumped my display. I don't know. It fumped my display. It knew I was talking about it bad. I'm sorry, go fumped. I won't talk bad about you. All right. All right. Ta-do! I'm just going to get my... And the message to you is, don't hate on things you don't understand. That will be fun. All right. So anyway, I hope in another 10 years, uh, all language installations will have this baked in. And we can tell our children about the good old days of pointless arguments. OK, up, up, up top, the notable cloud event in 2009 was Heroku coming on the scene to simplify deployment and, and production for devs, right? So I just remember this was like, oh, right? They had this build pack, and it, um, it would eventually enable containerized applications. But deploying a new version of an app was just like Git, uh, Git push Heroku. And it was just like, wow. And we see how using Git, at least for Heroku, was also forward thinking here. Because at the time, I think Git was only, um, I think it was invented by Linus in like 2005. Um, also, Heroku would write the famous 12 factor app and be published in 2011, um, which is based on web development and operation and scaling uh, witnessed on the Heroku platform. OK, back down here. Um, in 2010, you have NPM, the Node Package Manager, Node Package Manager launch. Uh, the ease of use of which a software developer can install and use libraries all in a command line changed the face of developer velocity and expectations. And it changed the game of software reuse, for better or for worse. Uh, and left pad, left pad, and all the others. But NPM also starts a trend of de developer tooling, open source companies, and it also brings in a newer era of venture-backed or commercial open source, which will continue to grow into this decade. And I'm intensely curious to see how this pans out, because there have been very angry people at the sort of changing winds of this. All right, speaking of open source, OpenStack was notable not because it had Go, but because it brought together an extraordinarily diverse group of vendors to create an open source infrastructure as a service. So this is the first time we have like an IAS. And this is the first time that we witnessed um, inter-organizational, multi-vendor collaboration that was different from Linux kernel development. And it was truly a newer, bigger open source. And we're going to see this uh, explode in a new project, Made in Go, which I think you know, and I'll mention it soon. So on the language side, we have append. Um, I was a little, um, when I was doing research for this, I didn't realize that append was added in after the Go and release. I think this is kind of like a glaring omission on the original open source, right? Like we need a way to make easier slice, slices easier to work with. And so append didn't happen until two years later. And there were lots of little improvements made during this first two years as well, right? Like including the dropping of the trailing semicolons. Uh, those get picked up by the compiler. If you, if, who programmed Go when they had um, trailing semicolons? Anyone? OK. I would have called, this was, that would have been an opportunity to call you the OG, the original gophers. I'll find another way. Anyway. Um, 
<clears throat> in 2011, GoFix was added. So this is automating and updating code, right? And looking for old versions of an API. Who uses GoFix when they're trying to, yeah. Um, if you ever need to break your API, like thank you, GoFix, right? And also here was the adoption of the first, uh, down here, YouTube. So this was big. And it was a milestone because this was the first time a company outside Google, a major company, adopted Go, um, to, and it was Vitesse, right, to, do, to solve MySQL scalability challenges. And they did this before the Go 1 compatibility promise. So in March 2012, um, that was Go 1.0, right? And it was the first time, and this is according to Rob Pike, and someone said I was wrong, and then I you know, talked to Rob Pike, and he said this, so whatever. Ha, huh, I got the Pike endorsement. But anyway, <laughs> this is the first time that a language explicitly made this promise at the source level, and it was very different from what was going on with other languages at the time, and the compatibility promise really changed things. First, the founders of the widely popular Vagrant, who used Vagrant at the time? Oh, memories, right? Um, anyway, <laughs> they were thinking about cloud, right, and scalability, and they learned lessons writing in Vagrant. And it was really this year that HashiCorp was born, and they rewrote their first infrastructure tool, Packer in Go, the first of many in the cloud infrastructure space. Another thing that was gaining steam were containers. Oh, Rip Core OS, so many. Well, Container OS, Red Hat, whatever. Um, but there were kernel primitives added by Google engineers in 2003, and infrastructure vendors were steadily increasing adoption of them. But this is the first time we had someone who was trying to get into the developer space and did away with the clunky package managers of YUM and APT, and instead used containers as the build unit for an operating system. And CoreOS wrote much of their container tools in gold, not not notably Rocket and etcd and Flannel and Claire. And next comes Docker. So Docker is really what, um, what is Go's killer app, right? So it combines LXC and the union file system, and it created a containerization standard adopted by millions of developers around the world with a fantastic UX. Docker is the fastest uptake of a developer technology ever, and it happened in this decade, and it was written in Go. And um, it, it uh, really takes off in 2014, but the first commits were pushed in 2013. We also have uh, Mesosphere, and other con con container orchestrators arrive on the scene. I have a t-shirt quilt of like dead container orchestration startups, right? Like it's pretty darn cool, but anyway, it would be the start of at least this era to be the great container orchestration race. All right, so this is where my mind gets like really, like this is literally how I see. So, if you see, there's a cluster of companies over in the, after the Go1 compatibility promise, um, but you can also see the adoption after the Go1 compatibility promise, right? In blue, there's usual users worldwide. There's somewhere around 300,000, although we just can estimate there. And then with contributors, you really start to see the slide, the slide, the slope go up, up, up after the Go1 compatibility promise, and also contributors who are hacking on Go and CoreOS and Mesosphere and HashiCorp are also contributing upstream to Go. And so by the end of 2013, we have almost 500 contributors and 300,000 users. So now the next five years. Are we getting bored yet? Here's some Dr. Seuss. <laughs> it's a really great book. If you haven't read it in a while, go reread it. It's just profound. All right. So. 2014, while the first school conference was in Tokyo in 2013, the conference that the Go team attended and that ignited a community was GopherCon in April 2014 in Denver, Colorado. This was beyond the organizers' uh, dreams in terms of success. It was enormously popular and it outdid expectations. At the top is, I think, one of the organizers' personal collection, Brian Kettleson, and this is uh, Brian, Rob Pike getting ready to talk. There's Rob in the lower left corner, and then there was a pre-party there. Uh, who, who is like an, I'll call you an OG now. Show, show me hands, who was at GopherCon 2014? You were OGs, Bill and Dave, OGs, OGs. All right, I get to call you OGs. All right, so two cool anecdotes that I really like to tell. Who happens to know, and you're just gonna have to shout it out, when the, when the tickets went online in 2014, who were the first two tickets sold to? Not Brian. Bill and Dave. No, not Bill and Dave. 
Mitchell Hashimoto and Armand Dagar, if you know HashiCorp, were the first to buy those tickets, right? <laughs> and the second story I like to tell is about Brian Kettleson and Eric St. Martin. When they were at looking, they just loved Go. And they had to come up with their own money to reserve the hotel room block. And in order to get that money, they had to put their own houses up for collateral. I mean, who does that for a conference? Katie? Shoot, uh, two, did you put in? I mean, this is like high bar set. But this is how much that pair loved Go. And I wanted to love something so much that I was willing to put up my house for it. OK, no history of GopherCon is complete without the Core OS bus. So, uh, this was really cool, and I met with the founder of CoreOS, Alex Polby, and I was like, okay, you got to tell me the backstory on this bus. And so he basically said, I have this buddy, and he's got this motor home, and I asked, hey, can I put a big, huge gopher with a cape on it? And his friend was like, yeah, cool, dude, bro. And they would take it out once a year to, to drive it out from San Francisco to Denver, which is about a 12-hour drive. And I say, where is it the other, like, 360 days a year? And they're like, yeah, my friend's driveway just somewhere randomly in California. So if you ever go to California to the Silicon Valley and the South Bay and San Jose, you're still going to see this bus. <laughs> All right, so here it is. The next big milestone is Kubernetes. So Kubernetes was open sourced at Google in summer 2014. And how many of you were working in the Kubernetes space or Kubernetes adjacent? All right. Right? And this is the new middleware of the cloud, right? And I don't know if it's a mistake or not yet. It's not a mistake. I'm just being facetious here. But um, it's really uh, changed the infrastructure in the DevOps space. And they've all really galvanized around it. And all the cloud vendors now have like a managed offering. And, and this form of compute has fundamentally changed, and it will change. It used to be VMs, and now it's going to be containers. Right? So this paradigm shift is going to need a bigger boat. And that boat is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So non-container Linux distributions saw that containers were going to change the game, maybe even put them out of business, right? And the Linux Foundation probably saw that too. And so they spun off the CNCF, and the term Cloud Native was born just four years ago. In Cloud Native Computing, it basically means that we use open source software and to segment applications into microservices, and we package each part into a container, and we dynamically orchestrate them to optimize resource utilization, right? Like, no biggie. It's easy, easy, right? So this rectangle up here, who knows what this is? This is the explosion that followed, right? Right, so this is the CNCF Cloud Native Landscape. If you can see at the very top blue bar, it says overwhelmed. And I, <laughs> yes, I am. But anyway, I've seen this grow almost nearly exponentially over the last four years. And each one of these icons is a project that fits into some aspect of the cloud native ecosystem. And as of 2019, over three fourths of all CNCF graduated projects are written in Go. And I don't have the stats pulled, but I'd wage over half of the remainder of the Go projects are also in Go. Go, in a short amount of time, is the lingua franca of cloud native. OK, so back to language. I'd wager that other than the most recent 1.13 release, the 1.5 release was the most significant point release since 2012, the 1.0 compatibility problems. This is where the compiler tool chain was completely rewritten in Go. And the garbage collector was, almost, was completely re-engineered. And as a result, we had then sub-millisecond uh, pause times during uh, garbage collection, right? Also, at the time uh, in summer of the 1.5 release, Women Who Go was born. Uh, GoBridge was founded, which is a part of Bridge Foundry. And also, later that year, a code of conduct was finalized. In 2016, the context package was introduced. And then, in 2017, the GC engineer did it again. 1.5 uh, microseconds now, not milliseconds, microsecond improvement in 1.8. So this is the, the man that's largely responsible for it. His name is Rick Hudson. He's the primary engineer for that garbage collection speed. He retired earlier this year from Google after a long and su successful career, and we were just lucky to have him. And I'd like to honor his contribu contributions from 10,000 miles away because he's earned his retirement. And oh, by the way, it's literally 10,000 miles away from Rick. <laughs> hey, Rick. OK. So finally, 
we have, uh, let me see what else is here. Yeah, we round out the end um, by the publishing of Vigo papers by Russ Cox, which would now become modules and the official dependency management the solution for Go, which I'll talk about soon, but also you're gonna hear about that in later talks today or tomorrow, tomorrow. Let's see. Yeah, it's here. So by the end of 2018, let's just talk a little bit about community here. We have grown to 1,600 contributors. We are anywhere between one and 1.6 million users. And we have 19 Go conferences around the world, not to mention um, other conferences where Go is also featured. Okay, so this year, 2019. As we move into this year, we see this growth improve, right? So we somehow, and I'm still wondering what's going on here, in the last 12 months alone, or less than 12 months alone, we've gone from 1,600 to 21 contributors. That's a 30% increase. We now have uh, what we think are about 20, 2 million users, which is a 25% increase. And our conferences are exploded, including GopherCon EU. So we are here and super happy. Um, you know, I just love to see this language grow and grow and grow. All right, so not, 2019 is so busy that I'm going to give it its own uh, slide. So GoVet was rewritten, and modules were put in as experimental in February of this year with the 112 release cycle. In March, the Go Developer Network was formed to bring up together meetup groups in partnership with GoBridge. In the span of eight months, it has grown to 46 countries, 159 groups, and almost 100,000 members for meetups. Um, however, there is China. Um, so we don't know what that is, but we know that China is more than all the other countries combined. This is Google Trends. And, and we hope to get to China in 2020 to kind of get a look behind there and see you know, what's going on with Go in China. Okay, so in May, the Go Playground supports third-party libraries. So library authors now can add playground links to their document to document their APIs, and they can test without installing the library on their own machine. Yeah, someone said, huh, good. So you learned something today. Go test that playground, import all to your heart's desire. Um, and then 113 release was the biggest yet, right? And it was very, very ambitious. Um, Go modules beta was released, and it came with a tool chain. And this was enormous engineering work with my, uh, the team that sits with me in New York. It has the mirror, the index, and the checksum DB. You're going to hear all about it. RAM uh, consumption decreases 20% across the board at runtime. And uh, the first go-to changes land. So improved number of literals and sign shifts, as well as some of the error functions. Um, yeah, and again, Go conferences have really taken off. So we've come to the end of the 10-year journey. And now, into the future, we go. Dr. Seuss voice. On and on you will hike, and I know you'll hike far and face up to your problems, whatever they are. First, uh, we're going to go back here, 2019 to 2023, uh, and I'm going to replace cloud with community. So now the community is growing and growing. This year we had uh, the Go Developer Network. It contains multitudes. Next year we want to have a Go Learning site or a Go Learning platform. So learning Go today leads to many choices, right? And we want to make those accessible, and we want to partner with educational providers and online code sites to curate some Go content. And we intend to partner with the GDN and, and the Learn uh, to Go together and in person at local meetups to do workshops, because studies show time and time again that the best outcome when trying to learn uh, a language is when you're doing it in a person, in a group, together. And I think Bill kind of knows that. <laughs> uh, we also have a go for graduation cap here. This symbolizes to me two things. The first is graduating up as a contributor. So the path to plus two, plus two, if you're not a contributor, is just another way of saying I have merge powers. <laughs> if you'd like to contribute to the project, plus two is Go's word for this, and I want to make that happen for you. And I'm, that is going to be my mission. So really, path to plus two ship. 
The second is seeing Go's language taught in computer science education. So right now, it's mainly taught in Java and in the US, uh, in, in the US exclusively at the secondary school level, it's Java. And that means a generation of graduates are understanding only one paradigm of programming. They're not being introduced to memory management or how the machine works or even functional. And so Go is a perfect multi-paradigm language that can do this. All right, so here's the two things that I can uh, like guarantee during, like it's really hard to guarantee anything when I'm up here. Um, but the modules tool chain needs to mature. We are in a transitory state, right? And it's painful, I'm not gonna lie, right? Having to transition from using whatever you are using to modules is, it's just, it, we have to all travel together, right? But what I do know is that a document, documentation spec is forthcoming. We have more blog posts. We're working with the tooling working group to coordinate and collaborate activities with regards to this module choose chain and go please and go static analysis and more. And so we recognize that this is a pain point and, but united we stand and divided we fall. Okay, um, go to. So I asked uh, Griezmer again on Sunday, what's go to to you? And he said, you know, to me, it's just a moniker for this version of future go. So everything that we've been doing is backwards compatible. And we've been starting to make changes, small changes, and we're gonna to continue to make them. And in the ideal state, generics are gonna get introduced in some 1.xx version, right? That they're gonna be able to find a way to make it work. Maybe not, but that's the goal. Um, and this will allow us at the packaging level, if we do go to 2.0 though, uh, the thing that we want to do is to continue to sort of make small incremental changes on the language side until everyone adopts modules, right? Because once that happens, you can call the language version in your go.mod file. And this is gonna allow us at the packaging level to keep compatibility even with two different major Go versions. Okay, so let's look, talk about the, uh, the ecosystem, TinyGo. So who's seen TinyGo and the bots and stuff? I'm really excited about this. So here's the thing. When you think about uh, embedded languages, three always come to mind, right? So C, Rust, and C++ maybe. But my, I just read that MicroPython is taking off and it was started right here in Australia. And if MicroPython is taking off, why not TinyGo, right? But here's another thing that I want to, to, to give to you. We have cloud IoT, right? Internet of things, right? We have data ops, we have dev ops, but what about thing ops? I believe that TinyGo embedded, taking uh, sensor data, putting it into a cloud, running AI and ML on it, and pushing it back out to make better decisions for um, the device consumers is going to be the frontier, and I want it to be in Go. I also like the idea that Go is not, uh, Go if you want, if you have WASM and WASI WebAssembly, Go can be your language up and down the stack. And this might be good for decision makers who don't want polyglot shops. In the next year or two, I'd also like to add Go as a supported language to Jupyter Notebooks. Who's used Jupyter Notebooks? Oh my God, amazing. And I want Go to be on there, right? So it, for those of you who don't know, it's a combination of text codes and graphics designed to enhance the information that we convey to our audience. Um, and this has been, in my opinion, the killer feature for Python and data science, right? And I don't see why that can't be the same thing for Go. So I'm also excited to see the growth of Go um, for Geo. And Geo just came out with a, they just told me yesterday they came out with a, a logo. So, oh well, sorry, Geo. But I'm gonna, I wanna see the growth of Geo for portographical, uh, port portographical? <clears throat> <laughs> Portable graphical user interfaces for Go. <laughs> seashells, seashells by the seashore. Um, for those of you that have been in open source for a long time, uh, you've seen that changes are afoot, right? And so as other projects evolve, we want to see what works and what doesn't and evaluate it for Go. So it goes back to the design philosophy, but we also want to know what else is out there. And I believe that there's a, a zeitgeist change for o open source and how open source projects work. And I think that, that Go needs to be aware of it too. All right. I didn't put cloud in there because while there's much work to do there, I'm particularly interested in seeing Go's place in edge computing, right? Edge computing is predicted to overtake cloud computing in the next decade. So while we're still early in this game, I'm really excited to see what we can do with that. But the Go team, um, if you want to know the future, you have to create it, right? But the Go team can't do it alone. We need everyone. 
I leave you with some final thoughts. I hope you've understood where Go comes from, where it has been, and where it is going. And I leave you with my favorite passage from all the places you'll go. Oh, copyright, I hope they don't get mad. But you have brains in your head, and you have shoes in, feet in your shoes, and you can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know, and you are the gophers who will decide where to go. So go together. Thank you.